welcome back to probably the most anticipated video on my channel ever not to hype you up oh man that's a lot of pressure <laughs> I'm sure you already know who you're looking at here because we share basically all of our same subs yeah we do we really do <laughs> but this is the beautiful Jamie who happens to be a professional wedding planner oh yes yeah, so for those of you who don't know me my name is Jamie Wolfer I am a wedding planner I'm also a fellow youtuber I have both a wedding planning account and then a personal account here on YouTube but on the wedding planning channel which is obviously gonna be the main focus of what we're talking about today I'm I share tips and tricks and advice and basically just want to educate people on the wedding industry so they can make informed decisions and not overspend and not get totally stressed out. And I know pretty much all of you guys are engaged. So I have mentioned that I'm kind of starting to transition more to like marriage content mm -hmm. since I'm now married, but you can go get your wedding planning fix over at her channel. She has you. so many good tips and tricks. When I was engaged, I watched her channel and she didn't even know that. So <laughs> did it. I did it. I randomly reached out to her and I was like, hey, I just found out that you're in LA and I, I'm kind of close to LA. Do you want to? And I was out? like, I have watched your videos. So she has so much good content. Go over there for like all the tips and tricks and everything. I knew that some of you had a little more like juicy and specific mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. So I thought it could be interesting to do a Q&A with a professional wedding planner answering your questions, which I got so many great ones. Yeah. I'm very excited about it. So I picked some that were asked quite a few times so that everyone would be happy. And I picked some that I don't know if you've ever answered. Oh, just to push oh. your boundaries. Okay. <laughs> Here goes nothing. <laughs> we're going to start off with like a simple one mm -hmm. an easy one ease okay. into it i can do that what is something that people commonly forget to plan for besides just like the weather contingency plan I, i'm gonna try my best not to say i have a whole video dedicated to this over on my channel for every single thing all of these questions can be like complete videos and probably are already complete yeah. videos so. the most overlooked part of people's wedding days and like or what they forget to plan on or schedule out time for is setup and tear down. Ooh. What I come into a lot or like what I come across with clients is, oh, it's okay. Our family and friends will do the teardown or it's okay. Our family and friends will do a setup. And I can say with full assurance, not once at one single event have these volunteers done everything that they're supposed to do or done it in the time that they're supposed to get it done. Mm -hmm. If you haven't been there on a wedding day, you just don't know how long setup takes and how long teardown takes. So be very generous with that time frame because you're going to need more than you think. I like that. Mm -hmm. Good to know. Mm -hmm. And a lot of venues have a hard out time, right? Yeah. So oh. you might need to move your wedding earlier in the day to make sure you're actually out by that time. Especially if you're DIY heavy, which I totally was for my event, so I'm not throwing shade. Like, I was I was really deep. I did too much. But that setup took hours, teardown took hours, and it's just something that I didn't anticipate. I'll be the first to say it, but it's, I also see a lot of couples don't anticipate it too. This is interesting. Any tips for couples that are not hiring a DJ? Is it possible to do it on your own if you plan diligently? And I assume that means like a playlist and some speakers. Yeah. Are there other ways? Uh, I would say that yes, you absolutely can. First tip, uh, Spotify actually has the option of transitioning your songs for oh, you so okay. it can kind of like fade in between songs. One thing that a DJ is great at is not playing an entire song. So they just play 90 seconds of it and then switch to something else. So your dance floor is constantly moving and constantly active. Mm. But the reason that I love DJs so much is because they really have their finger on the pulse of the vibe of the space. Mm. And they're the person with the microphone for directions. Mm. So if you cannot afford a DJ, cause I know not everybody can, absolutely throw together some playlists, make sure they are awesome, but make sure that there's a microphone if someone needs to make announcements and have someone designated to be your master of ceremonies or your MC to make announcements. Make sure they have a bubbly personality because honestly myself as a planner, I work hand in hand with a DJ to make sure that the timeline is kept as best mm. as we possibly can. So if you don't have a DJ, it's totally fine, but put someone in charge of the microphone, preferably someone who stays relatively sober. <laughs> a D MC. Yeah. So I have a lot of people that are engaged and like not going to get married for quite a mm -hmm. while. So is there anything that you can do when your wedding is like two plus years away or like how soon should you start doing things? I would say the sweet spot is like 18 to 12 months. Okay. Unless you really want to spend your time venue hunting that you can take forever to do if you want. So start looking now. A lot of places won't let you book like three years in advance. Some places do, but more often than not, they won't just because so many things can happen in a 24 month period. What you can do is play around with vision, go on Pinterest, have a lot of fun, and then save 
every single month save money towards your event every single month be putting something away because weddings are extremely expensive and you want to yeah. make sure that you're being really wise with your finances yeah so if you have time save a hundred dollars each month yeah save two hundred dollars save every time you get a five dollar bill throw it in a jar that is my biggest suggestion i love that and then do your research look into different photographers find out the pricing for your area you may not be able to book anyone two years out or more than two years out i should say but you can research mm. you can plan out your style and you can save a lot of money i love that because because we always talk a lot about finance on this channel. Yeah. And even if you're in a situation like me to where my parents paid for my wedding, which was amazing, being able to save towards your honeymoon or towards a house one day, which I wish. I mean, <laughs> right? California. Maybe one day. But that, that's an awesome intentional thing to do. This was one, this is totally opinion based. Okay. I picked it because I thought it could be juicy. But oh. what's your opinion? How many bridesmaids is too many bridesmaids? Okay, I'm gonna preface this by saying you can have as many bridesmaids as you want. It's your wedding. It's your wedding. That being said, if they can't fit on the platform where you're holding your ceremony, or mm -hmm. if they have to double up rows, perhaps it's too many. Just from like a purely Point logistical standpoint. That and then from a personal standpoint, if you want to be intentional and share time with each and every one of these gals, you have to pick what's best for you. Especially if you're an introvert, maybe don't have 14 people. Yeah. Because that's a lot of people to feel like you have to entertain. So your personality comes into play and then also the logistics of the space. And the more people that you have, the longer the ceremony ceremony, processional and recessional is, which those are such minimal details, right. it's not that big of a deal. Right. I would say once you hit 12, you may want to stop. You may want to stop. Plus, you don't have to get your bridesmaids gifts, but I spent a lot of money on mm -hmm. bridesmaids gifts, and if I had more people, I don't think I would have been able to get them such no. gifts. Yeah, exactly. This I picked because my personality is not that rowdy. So mm. this interests me. Do you have any advice for organizing a wedding reception that's fun, but has more of an emphasis on the meaningful, spiritual side of things instead of just like big, high energy party? Well, the spiritual aspect, that, that would be an interesting thing to try to incorporate. My favorite thing people really want to incorporate their faith into any part of their service is when they're really intentional about praying over the meal because it really does set the tone. Yeah. And then when people give toasts, having just the name of Jesus mentioned. It creates a certain vibe. It sets a different tone for sure. And then as far as wanting it to be more laid back, that's very strongly dependent on your music selection. Mm, yeah. Um, because if you play a bunch of 90s hits and people want to get out there and shake their tail feather to end sync, which is fine, it's great, but it's not gonna have that laid back vibe that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. So instead, I would say do those table visits, um, walk around and say hi to people, spend less time on the dance floor and more time in intentional conversation. So it depends on the kind of music you play. For really, sure. 100%. I didn't even think about that. These two kind of go hand in hand because one thing I highly considered doing for my wedding mm -hmm. was almost like a backyard, like backyard barbecue kind of feel, okay. which is not what we did at all. <laughs> no, but I was not. like, that could be fun because then it's not just like a rowdy drinking, dancing type thing. But mm -hmm. do you have any ideas for games guests could play that, here's the big catch, that aren't cheesy? Okay, how real do you want me to get? Completely real. We try to be as honest as possible over here on this channel. Okay, good, because I lie a lot of mine, so. <laughs> To be totally real with you, the majority of the time when people have lawn games, they're not used. If it's not within the guest's space, they're not gonna go out of their way to go do it. Mm. So if the photo booth isn't close to the bar or close to the reception space, people will not go out of their way to go to it. And mm. you will find that like you paid a lot of money for something that's not really used. Mm. As far as games are concerned, if you want to do something, it could be something on the actual tabletop. So it could be Mad Libs, or it could be a photo scavenger hunt. Sure, Cute. they sound a little cheesy, but they're ridiculous fun especially if you have a hashtag mm. and then you know it's like a picture of a drunk person dancing and someone <laughs> posts it to their story and then tags you like that's really fun so that's a great way also to include social media integration that kind of stuff yeah. but for the most part people aren't gonna leave their seats or leave the immediate area of the reception mm -hmm. so lawn games in our experience go mostly unused this is good for you to answer as okay. a planner what are some questions when you're choosing a planner and a coordinator that you should ask but you don't usually think of a whole video about this over on my channel there's a whole video i will link it below what are what are your favorite highlight points the standard questions are always going to be the standard questions how much you charge how many hours are you there how many assistants do you have with you what do you handle what do you not handle mm. those kinds of things gives you an excellent perspective for basically the parameters of this planner but one thing i think that i really impress upon people and even people who are considering hiring me i always say go talk to other planners mm -hmm. because personality of a wedding planner is immensely important because your photographer your videographer and your wedding planner are like 
in your face the entire day. And so if you find something about their personality grating or you kind of like them but you don't really enjoy their presence, that's a huge freaking deal. So you want to make sure that whomever you're entrusting this large amount of money to is someone that you trust mm -hmm. and someone that you actually like. Because that's a big deal. Yeah. I haven't really talked about this on my channel much just because I don't like to really degrade other people. But we did not go with my favorite wedding planner because she only offered a month out, not two weeks out. So she was double the price. Yeah. And in hindsight, I wish I went with her because she was much friendlier mm -hmm. than the person we did hire. Yeah. And it made a difference. Date around. <laughs> Seriously, please do. Well, I know sometimes people try to not have a wedding coordinator, mm -hmm. which I'm sure as a wedding coordinator, you feel strongly one way who should we get friends or family to make sure the timeline stays moving and mm -hmm. how should they do this one thing that I'm super transparent about on my channel is I didn't have a coordinator on my wedding day because you're already so good no it was a mess <laughs> And that's actually one of the reasons I started my business is because I was so motivated and wanted to be like, I don't want anyone to experience that. Yeah. However, that being said, I know that it is possible to do one without a wedding coordinator. Okay. My biggest suggestion would be, honestly, for the most part, I find friends and family to be pretty unreliable if they're guests. Mm. They just get distracted. They're just talking with other people and they should be. Like, yeah. they're there to hang out if they have a drink and then all of a sudden they realize that they haven't cued the DJ for toasts. You're kind of in a pickle. So I would say either have someone who is not a guest and then make it more specific. Say, we really need you to be our day of coordinator. Yeah. Compensate them with whatever you can, a gift card, a little bit of cash, a really good bear hug, <laughs> whatever it happens to be. Mm. That's more ideal than having someone who's present at the event as an attendee. But as far as from a professional standpoint, the two vendors that could possibly run your day, although if there are any of these two types of vendors watching this video, they're gonna wanna smack me through the screen right now, <laughs> would be your photographer and your DJ. Now that being said, it does pull them away from their normal activities if they have to manage your timeline but if you cannot afford it you talk to those two vendors ahead of time and say look we don't have a coordinator we really would love your help we just can't simply afford one can you help us to manage the timeline and make sure they know that ahead of time instead of surprising them with it so that would be my suggestion is no one that actually attends the event should be coordinating for you I picked this one because it was my biggest regret and my uh -huh. biggest flaw with my wedding. What is the best way to greet all of your guests, in your opinion, without missing out on the night? Mm. Especially at big weddings. I had mm. 220 people. Mm -hmm. What should I have done instead of getting stuck in my entry hall for three hours? Do you think it's a receiving line? Mm. Do you think it's going around to the tables? Do you think it's just saying, screw it, see me on the dance floor? Yeah, I would say, in my experience, at least with the wedding culture that I typically work with, I know a lot of places in the South still do receiving lines. We just don't tend to do them here in Southern California a whole lot. So for us, we typically suggest table visits. And table visits can be a little bit of a long time. So what we usually have is while the bride and groom are eating, the photographer and videographer teams will eat as well. So the second the bride Bride and groom are done they can do table visits and then the photographer follows them around and takes a picture with each table every single guest gets FaceTime with you but the convenient part of that is that you then have the excuse to be like I'm so sorry I have to go take a picture at the next table it was so good to see you that and making sure you have bodyguards mm. you have humans that are ready to jump in at a moment's notice when they see you like all deer in the headlights stuck in a corner where they jump in and say hey can I just steal you for this real quick and literally pull you away those two things one table visits with photos because it goes a lot faster and then to make sure you have plenty of people that are literally watching you my best friend's getting married and i'm going to be that person for her she didn't ask me she didn't ask me but i'm gonna pull her out like conversations i got you <laughs> when do i really need to send out save the dates fantastic question usually for me i say six months is always a safe space cool this is your safe space it's six months six months if you have a bunch of people coming from out of the country sometimes people send them 12 months in advance i don't feel like that's entirely necessary yeah um out of the country perhaps send them a little bit sooner but six months is a good place for save the dates which, by the way, are wholly unnecessary and 100% a fad. So if you are not in to save the dates, you don't have to do them. The way you circumvent that is, especially if you have people traveling from a long distance to go to your event, is you send out your invitations like 12 to 14 weeks in advance. It's still plenty of time for people to prepare, but you're not sending out another piece of paper that you have to design and print up and put a stamp on and organize and manage. But if you're not into them, don't feel like you have to have them. Tons of our clients don't use them. So interesting. Plus, I guess in social media world, people already know. Yeah. You already post, signed a venue for February 2nd, 2019. Yeah. And people are gonna be like, I'm most likely invited, I'm her cousin. Six months, if you send out save the dates, then it does buy you more time to send out invitations. You can send those out six to eight weeks in advance. 
I like that. Last but not least, because I, I'm just explaining why I picked all these questions at this point. I have a friend that I'm actually going home to her wedding soon and she posted a poll and she was said, do you prefer seating charts or no? And I was like, duh, obviously seating charts because I had one at my wedding. It was like 48.52. Yeah. Do you need a seating chart? What are your thoughts? Okay, so again, this is very culturally specific. In okay. fact, I, I made the mistake early on in my channel of being like, you need a seating chart. And so many people said, what? No, that we don't. We've never even heard of doing a seating chart. First of all, it kind of depends on where you come from, okay, and what the weddings around you normally are like, or what your culture is. Blanket disclaimer, okay. Mm -hmm. That being said, if you do not do a seating chart, you will need to have a ten percent additional contingency of tables, chairs, those kinds of things, perhaps an additional centerpiece, just in case, because the groups will not evenly work out the way that you want them to. In fact, we had a, I can think of a very specific event where it was open seating and we had to keep pulling out new tables because there was one family of six with small children that we couldn't split up. Everyone, and it was tables of eight, and so there was some with five, and there's some with six, and there's some with four, but we obviously couldn't split this family up. Right. And we opened up a new table and a bunch of people came and sat at it. And then we opened up another new table and I stuck an assistant there and I was like, don't move, this is for this family. And the couple ended up getting charged extra. There were no centerpieces, the linens didn't match. Just those kinds of details yeah. where it won't be perfectly even. Is it possible? Absolutely. Will you need to have a contingency added in there, especially if you're having a formal seated dinner? Hmm. Yes, you will. My preference is seating charge. Just because no. it's more, more managed. And you can make sure that you seat people with people they wanna sit with. Yeah, people they know. This has been so much good knowledge. Like I am seriously so excited about this video. Video. And if you want to hear more, we did another video on her channel. Now, I will link her channel down below. And make sure to go subscribe to her too because you come out with a video every week, right? Yeah. All wedding related stuff. So yep. it's so much good knowledge and information. Thank you for being oh on the gosh, channel. Thank you for having me. This was so much fun. I will link her Instagram and everything down below too so you can go stalk her. Just do it. Because it's 2019 and stalking people online is very socially acceptable 100%. now. 100%. 100%. Thanks for hanging out with us, friends. We love you so much. And I will see you next week. Bye. I was like, what's your outro? Bye. It's just bye. It's I love you and bye. I love you. Bye. Bye.